Hey, Laura, how are you doing? Hey, doing awesome. <laughs> oh, good. Excellent. A little nervous. Oh, so, so you deep. know, <laughs> deep breath, feel the love. <laughs> hey, Lila and Paul <laughs> and Victoria, Karen. Oh, Victoria, and- hey. Yes, I know. She's great. Yeah. She's used to listening to my, um, my high pitch squeals and my like, ah! <laughs> you know, the way that I talk. So yeah, everyone else is going to have to, you know, get accustomed to that. <laughs> Great. Hey, Lisa. Lisa is from Denver. Eric, I don't remember. Eric, t- sh- tell me where you're from. And then Jim Kedwell from Extensus in Portland hey, is Jim. on. Yeah. Great. It's great. So let us know where you're coming from because right now I'm trying to remember. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Eric from Chinatown. Hello. Here in Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, Josie, uh, let's see, uh, Justina is from Indiana, and Karen from Connecticut, and Dee Dee from Indiana. Great. Hey, Jason, Karen. <laughs> Jason, I already know, from Cupertino, and Aliona from New York City. Aliona. Wow. Yeah. All over the place. That's right. awesome. Yeah. And Victoria is uh, in Europe, so she's, she's chiming in from a long ways away. <laughs> she likes staying up all night to watch these things. Yeah, she does. <laughs> I know. Um, yeah, she's what nine hour at nine hours ahead of us. Yes. So, oh, yeah, so it's not that late for her. It's only like ten p.m. <laughs> yeah, she's like me. Um, I am a total uh, late night, or you know, um, late morning. You know, it's it's kind of embarrassing to admit, but um, yeah, you know, I need to own it. I usually don't wake up until around ten. <laughs> that works. This is perfect sometimes time. later, but this is perfect. I don't know. Uh, Victoria yeah. says it's actually family. eight p.m. there. Oh, oh, okay, that's not that bad. Yeah. And uh, Lila's calling in from Kansas City. Josie, thank you for coming in from Dallas. It's great to hear everybody is calling in. So uh, we are still three minutes off from actually getting started. If you will use the share tab underneath and let everyone know, your friends and followers, that we're going to get started. What's kind of cool about today's session is that Laura is going to teach some lessons, like some hands-on lessons and and teach you how to actually not that you know we haven't been teaching before a lot of our conversations are a little more um conversational we just talk about you know type and whatnot but you are actually going to give us some actionable steps to to develop our yeah. font today so cool and the other thing is use the tab underneath the questions and answers to not only put in your question, but also to vote them up. So if you find a really interesting question, please vote it up so then we can answer them in order. Yay, Sarah from Orange County is here. Richard Fink. Of- Richard Fink. Yay, Hello. On Friday. <laughs> Hello. And then Joe Manbeck uh, from Font Spring in Wilmington. Oh, wow. Hey. <laughs> okay. Excellent. So let everyone know on Twitter and Facebook, we're going to get started here in just a minute. So Laura, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, your background. I know we're not really getting started yet, but about your background. So where, how did you get into, first of all, calligraphy and lettering? Well, it really started, um, it all began when I was nine years old. Um, our, we had this teacher who uh, taught um, taught us, you know, was teaching penmanship. And instead of teaching like the typical roundhand cursive, you know, where all the letters connect, kind of like, um, uh, you know, what you're used to seeing, Palmer method and and some of those others, she decided to teach an italic print, Um, you know, kind of with the idea that it's just as beautiful, you know, as cursive. But because the letters aren't connected, it slows you down a little bit and, you know, grants you some legibility. And she was really poetic, like, in how she described, you know, all the letter forms. And I just remember being, like, it was, like, instantly, like, being woken up. You know, it was, like, I was no longer just a child, you know, just kind of, you know, with no care in the world. I suddenly was, like, wow, this is what I want to do. And so I kind of, like, made it my mission from then on that I was, like, I'm going to practice handwriting and I'm going to be the best at this. Like, this is going to be my thing. Um, My mom at the time was also taking a calligraphy class. And so I would swipe her books and her pens and... Yeah, and then she'd have to come hunt in my room and try and find them later. And um, that's great. Yeah, all throughout junior high, you know, elementary school, junior high, high school, um, it was all about you know lettering and calligraphy and handwriting. And um, but when I you know time came around for college, you know, I had done enough calligraphy by then that I said, okay, that's not that's not quite it. I grew up in a very computer centric environment, and I wanted to do something more in the computer. So my dad said, well, 
babes, why don't you get into, you know, graphic design? And, um, and my mom said, oh, you shouldn't encourage her to do that. She needs a backup <laughs> career. But luckily, you know, I, I didn't listen. And he was, you know, he defended that. And um, so I got into graphic design. And I thought, you know, it was kind of a means to an end. You know, I wanted to do more with lettering. Um, and so I did some, you know, commercial lettering during that time, but it was never quite enough. Um, so finally, like 2009, um, I met up with a friend, Charles Borges de Oliver, and he, um, you know, he kept talking to me about designing fonts, and he showed me some stuff. I was teaching at, um, at Highland Community College at the time, and um, he came, you know, the last day of, of class, and we kind of traded information, and he showed me a few things in Font Lab. We spent about an hour or so um, going over that, and um, I went home that weekend and started working on my very first font, Grindle Grove, and it was like as soon as I got in Font Lab, and as soon as I started working with it, it was like it was all over. It clicked. Do you know what I mean? It was like it was it was like this is it, and I said, you know, I I want to do this for a living. I figured it would take a couple of years. Uh, to transition, you know, I'd been a freelance designer and I was teaching part time and um, it didn't like it took uh, about nine months and I went, you know, from being a, a graphic designer to being a full time type designer and um, yeah, living the dream, quite honestly. Uh, it's awesome. I Waking love it. Up at 10. Yeah. And we can have a 10. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's yeah. perfect. So yeah. where are you? Where are you? Where are you right now? So I'm in Bonnie Lake, which is about 45 miles south of Seattle. So, yep, I live out in the woods, mm -hmm. you know, on a little over an acre of land, which is now getting flooded. So we have ducks in our yard, which is fun. Um, yeah, that's where I'm at. <laughs> that does sound like living the dream. Wow, beautiful. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining us. It's Nikki is calling in from BC, Canada. Has this little, Leela, uh, the sound working? Has it not started yet? The sound is working. Uh, just refresh. Let me tell her to refresh your browser. Okay, so we're going to get started here. There you go. Yeah, so Victoria says, yes, the sound is fine. I'm glad to hear that the sound is fine. Sometimes I don't awesome. ask, and everyone just can see talking heads. Yeah. Uh, thank you for joining us. We're welcome to the Typography Dojo. I'm your host, Rachel Elner, and I'm in Los Angeles, and Laura is calling in from Bunny Lake. Uh, Washington State, and I'm glad to see you all here. Uh, Laura, you want to tell us a little bit about your background, who you are, what's your bio? So real, I'll give you the real short story. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I'm a full-time typeface designer. Um, that's pretty much all I do these days. Uh, my background, um, when I first got started, um, started out with handwriting, went to calligraphy, went to um, graphic design, where I did a little bit of commercial lettering, and then um, 2010, I made the switch into being a full-time typeface designer. And so, wow. yeah, that's what I do. Yeah, oh gosh, lots of fun. Seven years, that's great. Excellent. Yeah. Very cool. So just as a reminder, uh, use the questions and answers tab underneath our video screen. And we are going to answer them in a row. We'll try to stay within an hour. I know I say that every single session and sometimes we go over. But we're going to try to stay for an hour so we don't keep you guys too long. Uh, so vote up the questions that you want answered first. I really appreciate it. So Laura, we're going to get started. I'll take a look at your presentation. And All right. You guys ready to get started? All right. Okay. So we're looking at your screen. Awesome. Awesome. And can you see me? We cannot. <laughs> You're okay. hiding behind your screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So this is um, kind of from hand to font, translating scripts. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of differences between lettering and type. You know, lettering is static. Um, you can nest letters together to work around each other. But if you want to turn that lettering into a typeface, you, you no longer have a static situation. Letters have to work together in any possible combination. So type is a system, you know, whereas lettering, again, is static. Um, when approaching lettering for the basis of a typeface, I, I really think it's important to look ahead. Know what challenges may arise so you may lay the groundwork to circumvent them and develop solutions as you move forward. Uh, doing this can help save a lot of time and frustration down the road. Believe me, when I first got started doing lettering for type, um, you know, there was, it was, there was a lot of frustration in getting that lettering to work for a typeface. And over the years, I really developed a process that seemed to work really well. So here are some challenges you may encounter when lettering for type. Um, elements, things like swashes or letters that are different sizes can look out of place in a recombination or cause collisions. And remember, you have thousands of possible combinations with letters, punctuation, numerals, 
all kinds of things can happen. Um, so they all have to play well together. Um, so, you know, when you have collisions, you can create ligatures to avoid them or bring some of the unique letter forms or flourishes back into play in the form of swashes. So all of the beautiful stuff that you did while you were lettering doesn't have to entirely go away. It can be brought back in. But I believe it's ideal to have the default character set working well in any combination without having to rely on features to make it work. Um, I always say that any feature that can be activated can also be deactivated. So again, it's important for a typeface to work well in its default setting. All right, so here is how I approach lettering for the basis of a typeface. First, I start out by experimenting with the lettering, and I don't spend a lot of time obsessing how I can make it work within a typeface at first, because it, it can be really confining, block your creativity. I mean, you just want to be able to play, you know, right, and see, see what types of things that you like and how stuff is working. But as soon as I've determined a style that I want to pursue um, and seriously start, you know, working on developing it, I like to work with either a dot grid or a blank sheet of paper with a guideline behind it so that, you know, I'm starting to kind of tame the letters in and, you know, be thinking ahead of how they're going to work in that system. So I like using templates, um, you know, and I don't use these all the time. I, a lot of times I use a dot grid, but um, this is really helpful. And I usually use this behind a sheet of paper, not drawing on top of it. Um, so first I start out, or I'm sorry, let's see. So, you know, we have slant lines here to help me consider collisions, baseline, a waistline um, to keep letter heights and visual mass in order, as well as ascender, descender, and cap heights. Laura, can you do me a favor and just bring sure. your curse? cursor to like where those areas are and just show us oh yeah oh. absolutely so here's your baseline yeah and okay. this is a waistline this is where the top of the x height goes you know so the top of your lowercase letters most of them anyway um your ascender and your cap and here's your dec your descender here and i put this little gray block in here so that um you know that kind of gives me some space between the next set of lines that i'm going to be working with oh smart yeah, and then and again, the diagonal lines just kind of help me keep, you know, any kind of slant that I want. And I have to say, um, I'm constantly revising this sheet for every project that I work on. So it never really remains the same, but this is kind of a good, a good starter. So now I'm, oh, let's go back here. So um, <laughs> before I show you that, I'm going to show, um, show you guys some original lettering I created for the basis of my typeface. And I have to admit, I was really hesitant to do this because um, it's my rough lettering. And well, it's exactly that, really, really rough. I don't spend much time at all trying to perfect the original lettering for a couple of reasons. Um, primarily because I can do all of my fine tuning in the computer. And the secondary reason is that I never know for certain if the lettering I've created will work or not. Um, I have probably about a 50% kill rate. <laughs> so about half of the stuff that I start working on will never see the light of day. So it's not uncommon for me to, you know, letter something, you know, get it all going, put it into Font Lab, you know, I try to rough up those letters, uh, the outlines, you know, kind of quickly and then, you know, start working with it. And, um, and half the time I go, yeah, this is a disaster. It's time to go back to the drawing board. The other half the time I go, okay, this is workable. Laura, you know, just a question. I'm sorry. So how do you determine the angle? Does the angle change for every project? It does. And a lot okay. of times I determine it based on the experimental lettering that I've done. Uh -huh. You know, I'll look at that experimental lettering and say, okay, so, you know, what's roughly the angle of the letters that I'm, that I'm liking here? Um, but usually, you know, around 10 to 15% is kind of like a good, a good baseline for where your diagonals or where your slant should be. Thank you. Paul asked that question. Okay. Oh, not a problem. <laughs> um, so let's see. All right. But yeah, I was just going to say, it's kind of an iterative process, um, getting back to the, you know, drawing, you know, lettering and then getting into a typeface and then sometimes going back to the drawing board over again. And then, you know, it's, it's back and forth quite a, a bit between analog and digital. But, um, but I have to admit, you know, showing my work like this in the raw gave me a bit of anxiety and I didn't decide to do it until a little bit later um, because it's by no means my best lettering. But I think that there's a need for being authentic and honest. Um, it wouldn't be helpful for me to show you something I've cleaned up and made perfect and then try to pass that off as something that it's not. Um, so you'll be able to see by these scans, they show everything, warts and all. All right, so let's take a look here. All right, so here is um, the basis of lettering for uh, Pominder. And so you can see that um, I, a lot of times we'll start out with um, what I like to call a pencil skeleton. And, you know, so that's um, this right here, there would have been probably, I don't know, 20 to 30 different sheets 
of practice lettering before I got to this phase of really kind of trying to figure out the style, figure out what I want to do. Um, and then when I say, okay, it's time to letter this for, you know, for the font, um, you know, I'll sit down and kind of like spread out all of those different sheets. Okay, I see what I have to work with here. And then I'll sit down with intent and, you know, I'm working here with a dot grid, as you can see, and, you know, really start, you know, lettering this up. And so a lot of times, um, you know, I'll start out with like a really light pencil skeleton where I'm putting in those letters so that by the time that I get to using, this is done with a pointed pen or like a dip nib, um, you know, it's pretty straightforward and I, I can see what, you know, what I need to do. And um, I sit down with a dip nib and I can make those letters look the way that I want them to. Otherwise, it kind of just becomes an experiment again. <laughs> so I don't always do this, but um, it's pretty common. I would say that 70% mm, of the time I'm using a pencil skeleton. And there is kind of the finished version of that. And so you can kind of see some of the similarities there, except for that it has swashes. All right, so here is fair water. And this is an interesting one. Um, you know, I did work with a grid in the background. I'm not showing it here in the image, but there was a grid back there. And you can kind of tell by how everything sits so straight and neat and tidy. Um, this was actually sketched on the iPad Pro in Procreate using the Apple Pencil. Um, I don't really do lettering in there per se, but I do a lot of sketching, you know, with pencil. Um, it just works amazingly well. It's one of my favorite things. Uh, just love it. And there is what the finished version looks like. And so this is, um, yeah, my, I think my scanner was like really dirty at the time <laughs> I scanned this in. Um, this is some lettering for Alfresco. As you can see, you know, we go from here to there. Um, this is kind of playing around with ligatures for my typeface uh, Winsome. And so, you know, I introduced a ton of ligatures in there because I wanted to maintain as much of the natural look of lettering as possible. Um, kind of an important note is that a lot of these letters, you know, such as like the O, the V, and the W in particular, generally connect from the top. And that's because, you know, as you draw your exit stroke, you know, as you're ending that letter, your pen or your writing instrument stops at the very top of the of the waistline. And so usually, you know, you go and you connect into another letter. This is great, except for when you have certain letters that follow it, such as the R, the S, the X, and the Z that have entrance strokes, and they get really kind of awkward to, you know, combine. And so going back to this idea of using, um, you know, creating a, a good default, you know, I wanted to, um, I didn't connect those letters at all, the O, V, and the W. And I went in through ligatures and made them connect to the next letter to follow so that I could, you know, kind of capture that look without, you know, making the base or the default set not work at all. And there's what it looks like. And there's my ligatures. And you can see I've got a couple of fun ones down here. Like it's T and R. That was cool. Oh, wow. Yeah, kind of fun. And, you know, you can do all kinds of interesting things, you know, with ligatures or contextual alternates. Um, yeah. So, you know, another note, um, I've been designing type for almost seven and a half years now, and there's been a lot of practice over that time on lettering for a typeface. So while I don't use my guides as, as much in the more, anymore, um, in the beginning, they were incredibly important to help train my eye. Now I can sit down to a blank sheet of paper, although I rarely do that. I almost always use a dot grid and know how to draw those letters in a way that they're going to work out right out of the gate. So it's kind of like a little bit of training has gone on, you know, where um, I don't have to rely on that so heavily, but um, I find it to be really essential when you're first getting started. Um, so here is uh, some brush lettering for Ed's Market, which is actually a place in Portland, um, <laughs> a little corner store. And you can see, you know, how I went from here, you know, to there. Um, yeah, lots of fun. All right, so here's some important things to consider when lettering for a typeface that when doing lettering for the typeface that results from it. Um, most of the problems with typefaces have to do with inconsistency, and I'm talking like 80% of them. Um, so I can't begin to emphasize how important it is to identify problems when you're first working with lettering or type. Um, you know, if you don't know what it is that's going wrong with it, it's pretty hard to fix it. So you need to identify those problems first. So here's a list of what to look for when aiming for consistency. Um, stroke weight, angle, visual mass, um, which is, you know, height, width, and weight, as well as overall letter size and spacing. Um, some other problems you may run into are connections, collisions, um, hard to recognize letter forms. Sometimes people take maybe a little bit too much um, creative license with letters. I, I saw one typeface recently where the R looked like an N. 
and you know, it was, it was, uh, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, I had to look it up. It's like, is this a typo or is this, <laughs> you know, how it was designed? And so I see that from time to time. And so it's kind of important to, you know, as you're doing lettering, as you're working on type, you know, go back and kind of check these lists. When you look at it and you say, something's wrong here, I don't know what it is. Not really sure. I like to go back and go through here and just say, is it this, is it this, is it this? Um, so again, while I don't worry too much about getting my lettering perfect when I'm creating it, I keep all those things in mind, you know, as a framework to create within it. It really helps me consider how to create the letters and avoid potential issues and preemptively think of, you know, such solutions. So I can, you know, as I'm going through, I can say, okay, so here's how I'm going to fix this. You know, like I, I like this, I want to keep it, how do I handle it? So I made up an example of what happens when I just letter something without any regard to how it's going to work in a typeface and look through how to address the issues that have resulted and how to fix it. So I just kind of, you know, pulled out this word here and, um, and I really like it. This is one I've been using for a while. Um, so here's, here's why I like using this word. It contains a dozen of the most used letters in the English language, um, E-T-A-O-I-N-S, H-R-D-L-C-U-M, you know, those ones kind of, except for D. Um, it includes all the vowels. Mm -hmm. It has one of the most difficult letters to connect to, which is the letter R. It has three ascenders, the B, the H, and the L, all of which are quite different. Um, three descenders, the G and the Y, which sometimes can vary in form and use a diagonal, and the P, which has a left descender, which can cause collisions with all of the other descenders that have a right side stem. So if you had a G next to a P, it's pretty common that they might collide. So I like to use that one. Um, a letter that connects from the top naturally, which is the O. Uh, two letters that connect from the middle, the P and the B here and a letter with a crossbar, and a letter with a tittle, the I. I mm -hmm. just love that word, tittle. <laughs> <laughs> so what I did from here is I put this word into adhesiontext.com, and this is a site that was developed by Adobe Typeface designer Miguel Sousa to see what other words can be created from, you know, if you have, if you've only, say, created 10 letters, you can punch that into this website, and it will develop, um, it'll pull up basically all of the words in the alphabet, um, the English alphabet that have those letters in them. And this is great because then you can develop a test string to start looking at, you know, things and see how it works. So let's see what happened. I'm going to warn you guys, your eyes are all going to be bleeding after you see this. Yeah. <laughs> this is a disaster. <laughs> so as you can see, it's created all kinds of problems. Um, I have letters colliding, inconsistencies, connections aren't lining up, and, you know, it just generally looks untamed and chaotic pretty hideous. So let's address what's wrong with it. So my three main problems are collisions, inconsistencies, and connections. So first, there are collisions occurring with many of these letters. You know, if we put in diagonal guidelines in here, you can see how this letter overlaps the space allotted to it. So if you kind of go like, okay, so this is like the body of the letter here, you can see that it starts to kind of break out of this space. You know, we have, um, it's fine with the connection, of course, but, you know, we've got this loop coming out here. That's going to collide if there's a letter sitting right next to it, another ascender. Um, another, you know, if you had another ascender or, you know, an I or a T, it would collide with this swash right here. So kind of trying to keep things within, you know, within these diagonal guides is, um, is a good idea. You know, I would have been able to see if there was conflict, you know, had I actually used a diagonal guideline. Um, yeah, <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> here are some common collisions and uh, some of the more difficult letters to design with. It's basically anything that has ascenders, descenders, and letters with a crossbar, and sometimes letters with a tittle as well, um, depending on how high up you place that tittle and where you put it. All right. In a world where letters collide. That's my best movie introduction <laughs> voice I can summon. So, you know, in the first translation of lettering to type, there may be some letter pairs that won't connect well at all. I try to, you know, avoid this altogether in the default character settings, but if you want a more natural looking script, you can create alternates of those letters and program them to work through contextual alternates or through ligatures. Um, I prefer to use contextual alternates because of the diacritics that are needed. Uh, you won't need to expand the character set as much by handling it that way. You know, when you, you start getting into ligatures and, um, you know, now it's, it becomes a little bit more complicated to add diacritics to, you know, two different letters that are, you know, made into one character. But, you know, whatever you choose to do, you know, let the user know what options are available in the form of a user guide. And I think it's also a good idea to offer alternate letters um, with diacritics to kind of work around this. 
So next, I'm going to look at some inconsistencies. And I can check my lettering against the list I've set, which is um, weight, angle, visual mass, and spacing to determine any issues and fix them. So, you know, a quick note about consistency, and I want to bring this up. There are typeface designs that have inconsistencies and irregularities throughout, and they still manage to make them work. You know, we've seen a lot of the style lately, especially in some of these hand-lettered scripts where you have, you know, some letters are small, some are large, you know, um, some drop below the baseline. You know, they do really interesting things. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, the trick with this is to repeat some of those characteristics throughout and make them look obvious enough that they look intentional and not accidental. So kind of developing a system. You know, if I have a letter like this N that drops below the baseline, maybe it's a good idea to introduce this element right here into the H into the M, which is a similar character. Um, and maybe since I've got this O form that's round, which is small, maybe that's a good idea to introduce that to the C and the O, which are also round letters and um, make them smaller as well. So. But with the screen, let's take a look first at weight. So these stroke weights are pretty inconsistent, but you know, I can use that by using circles to test the weights. So I put in a little circle here, and you know, it's, it's a lot harder to kind of, um, you know, when you're working with a sans serif or a serif typeface, it's pretty easy to measure you know, the, um, the weight of a stem. Um, you know, but it becomes a lot harder when you're you know, working with something that is a script. And so using these little circles works out really well. So this is gonna be my default you know, thick, and as you can see, I've pasted over to this thick, you know, stem here, and I've got some overlap. So this one is not as thick as this, and it's really in the O. You know, there's a big difference here between the weight, as you can see. Same thing here. You know, this is the circle I've used for my thin stroke. Um, it's starting to, you know, it's not quite as thick on this um, exit stroke here, and it's way too thick on that side of the O. So we can go in and fix that, and that should help clean it up some. Great. So the next thing I want to look at um, are the angles. And as you can see here, they're quite different. Um, you know, you can compare them to each other and within the diagonal guides. So, you know, I've got like the B looks like it's leaning backwards. Um, the L could essentially be okay, um, but might want to straighten it out a little bit, starting to lean a little bit too far forward to the right. So it's another thing to consider. So visual mass. So, you know, I want to... Um, you know, I want to address this one because, you know, when you start getting into some of these um, fonts that have a lot of irregularities, you know, you're going to have some differences in visual mass, and sometimes that's okay. But um, you want to make sure that you've done it in such a way that um, they kind of all together, like if you were to use your squint vision, squint your eyes and kind of look, that they kind of color about the same. You know, we don't have letters that are looking significantly smaller or larger or, uh, you know, anything that kind of starts to throw you off when you're viewing it. So next is spacing. You can see it's really inconsistent. Some letters are too close. Some are too far away from each other. Um, you know, and, and one thing I wanted to mention, too, about, you know, spacing is um, it's easy a lot to um, consider the black of the letter as being, like, the most important part. But it's also the white space around the letter that's absolutely critical to pay attention to. You know, especially, um, you know, as you're drawing some of these forms, I think that, you know, looking at both that negative space or the white space around it, you know, helps you determine whether you've drawn your outlines correctly. But also, um, you know, here's kind of an interesting test. If you take a font that, for example, a text face that's bold, and you start to space it really far out, you notice that it starts looking a lot lighter. And when you start to compress it, it looks a lot heavier. And so that spacing plays a lot, it plays a massive role in how your type is going to turn out. And it's something that I think is overlooked quite a bit. You know, we tend to focus, again, on the black of letters. We think of that as being the design. But, you know, in, in reality, it's really both. All right, so once we have all the consistencies resolved, uh, the next step is dealing with connections. And as you can see here with this little red horizontal guideline, the entrance and the exit strokes are hitting at different points. So I have some that are going like above here, some that are going below. Uh, it's important to have all of these meeting up at the exact same spot. Um, to get them to seam up properly, they have to begin and end at the same place. And you want to have an overlap included on the ends of the ex entrance and exit strokes so that you don't get any kind of little breaks in between there. So they have to, you know, like this N is great, for example, that T would probably work. Um, but they have to start and stop at the same place. So letters with entrance strokes, which are commonly the R, S, X, and Z, typically present the greatest challenge as the connections from a letter preceding it, um, say, for example, an OR or a VR, uh, makes it really critical that that pairing, you know, 
connects smoothly. So I like to use the R as my control character, working out the entrance and exit strokes, and using the entrance strokes for the other letters that require them, and the exit strokes as well um, for all of the other letters. So it's kind of like creating a template of exit and entrance strokes. You know, once you've got them fine-tuned and perfected, you can take those, attach them to the other letters, and then you know for sure that things are going are gonna to work properly. So I've made up a little video, and this was actually included in um, another series, and we'll talk about this. Um, this is kind of how I've worked out the connections with the letter R. And after this, I'll show you what the lettering looks like when it's been fixed up, and we can compare it to the original. So bear with me. This video is about three minutes. We can hardly hear the audio, Oops. Laura. So if you want to just talk us through it, oh, there it goes. <laughs> Can you turn it up just a bit more? Oh, sure. Thanks. Right. Yeah. To avoid a hairline gap between the exit and entrance strokes, we need to create some sort of overlap. So I'm going to create a rounded tip at the end of the exit stroke to start with, and then we're going to copy and paste it to the entrance stroke. First, cut the end off of the exit stroke and draw in a tip, keeping all of it within the mask, which is why the mask is there, to make sure that the tip stays within it. If any part of it extends past the mask, you'll end up with a bulge. I draw a rounded tip, to me it looks a little more polished, but another option would simply be to extend the exit stroke a little bit past where it's cut, and that would create an overlap as well. Next, we copy and paste the tip that we created on the exit stroke to the uh, entrance stroke. In the metrics window, type in two R's and view them at different sizes to make sure that you have a nice smooth connection, everything is working the way it should. So now you have a master entrance and exit stroke to apply to the rest of your letters. And what I do from here is continue to draw the rest of my letters, leaving the entrance and exit strokes of them open. Then I come back to this master form to copy and paste these strokes into them. Hmm. So with that said, here's another little tip. In certain instances, you'll have to adjust the master exit stroke to work with a different letter, such as the letter G I'm showing here. How I handle something like this is to paste in the exit stroke in the approximate location where it needs to go, mark it, then move the exit stroke of the G into place. You may have to make some adjustments to the stroke and maybe the tip as well, paying close attention to the mask, but once you're done, this new exit stroke can be pasted onto the other letters with loop descenders. For All right. Right. For consistency. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, and the thing, you know, that's a, a video where I was kind of talking pretty fast in that um, I do have that posted online. So um, you guys can go in and, you know, slow it down and kind of watch it again. Um, but I wanted to kind of get through it kind of quickly so that, you know, um, we're not spending too long on that subject because we have a lot of other things to talk about. Um, so if any of you were like bewildered, you know, um, going, what the hell is she talking about? You can go back and watch it. And, um, and there's more information that I have out there for you too. So anyway, so here is the lettering that I did when I, all, when I fixed it all up. So there is what it looked like before, after, before, after. <laughs> As you can see, it went through quite a bit of changes. Um, and here's the, you know, the original word, uncopyrightable. This is the, you know, um, there's the, this is the before, and there's the after. Wow. 
Yeah, and so now I could, what I can do here is, you know, this one has a little bit more character and some more things going on, but I can take stuff like this, like the swash and the H, or this really long loop descender, this unusual one here on the Y, and bring those into um, alternates. And so, you know, with a little bit of work, I can make, you know, go back to bringing in some more character to this. All right, so, so here, let's talk about some options to avoid conf, uh, connection conflicts with, um, with certain letters. One thing that you can do is to create a semi-connected script, which generally is more natural. You know, I don't think that most people handwrite or letter in a semi-connected fashion as certain letter pairs are difficult to connect to naturally. You know, we discussed the O to the R, um, you know, or like the V to the S, you know, those, those don't naturally connect. And so people t tend to handwrite them and not connect them. Um, so it's a little bit more natural, you know, natural looking. Um, you can also design the connections of letters that connect from the top, such as the O, V, and the W, um, so they connect from the bottom. And that kind of resolves that problem. Um, also, if you want to maintain the look of top exit strokes, again, in the O, V, W, you can keep the connections higher up, which is more natural looking, and then go back and create ligatures or contextual alternates to connect those letters, you know, with, with uh, the entrance strokes. So once I've worked that out, I like to create standard connections to use within the groups of letters throughout so I know they'll connect properly. So here are some letter groups and their connections. So we have entrance stroke letters, R, S, X, and Z, and then we have exit stroke letters. And so basically, like, um, for example, these can all share the same exit stroke right here. And these ones can all share the same exit stroke. But this is going to be a different exit stroke than this one. Same thing with the OVW. And then, of course, when we have descenders, they're going to connect differently as well. So I like to kind of, you know, create kind of a master, I guess you could say, of each one of those to copy and paste and to, you know, bring into the other letter forms. So quick note about uppercase letters. So most uppercase letters don't and won't naturally connect, um, such as the F, O, P, Q, S, T, V, and W. Um, when they do connect, however, I rely on the connections made for the lowercase. I bring those in and make them identical. Um, when I design them, I usually like to use the letter H as a control character to the right of the uppercase letter, as it's most likely to collide due to its spacing the left ascender. So for example, um, you know, in a, in a word like, a, like if you had VH, I don't know why you would have that, but if you had like a capital V and an H, I would, you know, use that H as the um, spacing character next to the V and next to the T, next to the A to, you know, start up kind of a, an idea of my overall spacing and how it's all going to work together. So I thought real quick we should talk about um, some pros and cons of a fully connected script. And um, we're going to talk about semi-connected as well. So, you know, one really good thing about fully connected scripts is that you get a really even coloring of the type, meaning that, you know, it's when you look at it, um, there's a lot of rhythm, there's a lot of consistency. Um, when you use your squinto vision, again, and you kind of, you know, squint down and you can kind of make the letters look a little bit gray and blurry, things look nice and, and harmonious. Um, so, you know, we've got that. Um, also, if you set up the spacing correctly, um, you can actually get it to a point where you can have literally very little kerning or no kerning at all in the lowercase to lowercase. And um, I found that to be really interesting. I, um, some people have said, oh, connected scripts are so difficult. And it's like, well, yes and no. You know, I think that, um, you know, I think that once you learn how to do connected scripts and make those connections work together, they're actually quite easy. And again, if you do it right, you won't actually have any kerning whatsoever in the lowercase to lowercase. Um, if it's all fully connected and you have no ligatures and contextual alternates. So that's the case with, you know, with the script right here, which is spare water. Um, so that's a great thing. Um, but, you know, on the, on the tough side, um, or the con, I guess you could say of this, is that they can be more challenging to design. Um, you spend a lot more time working out connections and developing solutions, you know, whether it's through ligatures or contextual alternates. So here's some things about a semi-connected script. So the pros are that, you know, there's fewer concerns about connections, you know, especially if you stay away from connections such as the B, F, O, P, R, S, X, and Z. Um, you don't have to worry about those so much because you just design them so they don't connect. Um, a con, though, you know, is that there's more spacing issues and, um, and more kerning. So it becomes a little bit more challenging, you know, to, um, to do that well. And it, it, it kind of works into this uneven coloring and inconsistent letter spacing at times if you're not careful. Um, all right. Wow, that's it. 
Wow. Thank you. So, you know, I really hope that this helps shed some light on this, um, introduce you some challenges you may face with lettering, um, how to approach your letters, and identify some key issues that will help you find a way to resolve them. Um, so not long ago, I participated in a Connected Scripts webinar for Font Lab, and there's some information out there about that, and Rachel is going to post in a link. And a really big thanks to Rachel for making this all possible. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Okay, we're pulling off of your presentation. And thank you so much. Yeah, can you not, see us, Laura? Can you, yeah, can I you can. See us? Okay, okay, excellent. Very cool. Awesome. <laughs> so this link, uh, Victoria had posted, I think that is the link actually to your font lab, but I haven't just double clicked and checked yet. So I hope so. Anyhow, so we have tons of questions. I actually have a lot of questions as well. <laughs> One thing I, I noticed. Did I open up Pandora's box? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> but I love how when you're working with scripts, you really see the grid of the letter form. Like yeah. that grid is like you have to go by it because, like you said, less kerning, right? Because they have to be connected. Mm -hmm. So you need to make sure that they start and end every single time. So it just exactly. really proves that there is a grid to every part of design all the way down <laughs> to the letter form which I need to keep telling my students. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you, Laura. Yeah, no problem. Excellent. Let's go through and answer some of the questions. We're going to go through, we have uh, 10 questions. Oh, awesome. thank you, Victoria. Great. She's posting the Font, font Lab webinar. Awesome, awesome, awesome. She is like the most awesome, helpful person ever. <laughs> Seriously, I totally love her. <laughs> Very cool. So we're going to start with uh, Sam's question. Uh, she's asking, what's a good book for hand lettering, for a hand lettering beginner? Well, I actually have a PDF that I've posted on my website um, that has, you know, uh, some lists of them. There's, there's quite a few. Um, boy, it almost kind of depends on what kind of lettering you want to do. Um, there is a book by Molly Suberthorpe, Modern Calligraphy, which is pretty good. Um, Sheila Waters is a classic, Foundations of Calligraphy. Um, let me see, there's like Mastering Copperplate, uh, which I think is a really good book because it's the essential, um, you know, round hand alphabet, really. Um, boy, there's a lot of them. I'm going to post a link to that on my um, Facebook page. So, yeah, if you guys all want to go take a look there, because I actually have like PDFs of all kinds of resources. I have, you know, links to supplies, links to books, links to type, you know, like workshops and everything you can imagine. So I'll put that up there so that I can give you guys a more prehensive an comprehensive answer. <laughs> we also have a, a topography dojo group so I can invite everyone there and we can link to your pages from there. So this yeah. way it's just one spot to go. Okay, excellent. Sounds good. Yeah. Let's see here. So Aliona's asking what letters slash ligatures slash phrases phrases do you suggest we design first? Hmm. So for ligatures, I would start with that group that I mentioned, um, O, V, and W, connecting to um, R, S, X, and Z, because those are the most complicated ones to really get right. So ligatures. And then what was the other part of the question? Uh, phrases. Oh, Jeez. phrases. Yeah. Hmm. Pangrams. Yeah, I really, really like working with pangrams. So a pangram is a sentence that uses all of the letters in the alphabet. You know, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. You have all the letters in there, you know, you're, yeah, and you get to see them all together. Um, there's also a really good um, paragraph by um, Leslie Kabarga that you can Google. It's called Kern King. And what he did with Kern King is it's a huge, long paragraph, but it contains almost every um, letter combination that that you need to have and so sometimes I'll letter with that but most of the time I letter with pangrams you know pack my box with five dozen liquor jugs um, forsaking mon class. yeah yeah <laughs> forsaking monastic tradition 12 jovial friars gave up their vocation for a questionable existence on the flying trapeze whoa you know these <laughs> right? I love it. oh I love yeah these. I have them all never <laughs> let me tell you yeah I have a list you know but I go through and I use pangrams Right. Yeah. Right. Excellent. Cool. Oh, and know. was there another part of the question? So she said phrases. Yeah, phrases. And she said ligatures, letters, ligatures, and phrases. Oh, okay. So yeah, letters, ligatures. So with letters, um, I think kind of like going by group system. So, you know, starting out with like the letter A, for example, is a really good letter um, because that A translates to the P, to the Q, to the B, to the D. Um, N is another letter. N. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, so that one's a good one because that relates to the H, that relates to the M. Um, you know, I like using that word uncopyrightable because it really, it encompasses almost everything that you need, you know, to, you know, to use for some others. I also think it's important in the beginning, though, to um, add in some of the more unusual and difficult letters to work with, like the F, the K, and the Z. Um, those are all, you know, really unique letters that a lot of times march to the beat of their own drummer. Um, I think those ones are good. But a lot of times, you know, for example, if I've um, done the letter, you know, H, for example, I won't bother with the letter M or the N right away because I've already created the basis for those letters to work from. Um, yeah, same thing like with the A. Um, you know, the E can also be tricky. Yeah. So basically the whole entire alphabet. A lot of people start with a capital R, right? Yes, that's actually my favorite for capital letters. Um, you know, and here's something interesting that I tend to do is I actually like when I'm first, you know, working on lettering for a typeface, I only do the lowercase. I may experiment some with the uppercase, but okay. I actually really focus on that one particular element because I find that, you know, 96% of the time we use lowercase letters in our setting. And so it's really important that they harmonize and they work really well together. With the uppercase letters, um, I find that once I've done that lowercase, it oftentimes changes the style quite a bit. So if I started by designing uppercase letters as well, I may end up tossing out most of them and have to start over anyway. So I'll kind of play with it, you know what I mean, and see how it goes. But um, but yeah, I, I move over to the uppercase letters after I've done the lowercase. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We're going to go to the next one. So Alina is asking, uh, what is the minimum number of variations per each lowercase and uppercase letter that you include in your finished ones? Ooh, so I include it basically four. You know, I will have um, a beginning, an ending form, and an isolated form or a medial form. Um, so a beginning form, um, and 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 that some of that kind of varies depending on the letter. You know, like. A lowercase a won't need a beginning form. But say like a lowercase r will need a long entrance stroke. And then, you know, all of them will have exit strokes that are shorter. You know how, um, like have you ever seen fonts like where, um, you know, scripts where you have, you know, these really long exit strokes and they start to look kind of hairy and they start to kind of interfere with the spacing. Um, so I like to shorten those and make those smaller. So in the situations where I have both an, a beginning form and an ending form, then I have to create what's called like an isolated form or a medial form, something that sits in the middle and basically combines the beginning and the ending. So yeah, so at least two per letter, but at least two, but four. normally four. Okay. Great. Upwards of four. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. All right. Alain is asking, she went through about, I think she put down five questions. So we're just going through them. So what are your favorite tools? Inks, brushes, papers, both for practice and for finish? Well, I am a huge fan of um, vintage wet noodle pens, which I know a lot of people are like, what's that? Wet noodle. Um, yeah, yeah, it's too bad I didn't pull one up here with me. Um, so it's basically like a dip nib as a fountain pen. And they made these, you know, back in um, like the 1860s to the 1940s. And um, they were incredible tools. You know, they, um, they work like a dip nib, but they're a fountain pen. Um, so you don't have, you know, any worries about constantly, you know, dipping your nib back in the ink again. Um, uh, you know, they create a variation of stroke, wet noodles do. They're both responsive and, um, you know, and, and vary, you know, as far as like the flexibility goes. Um, so if I'm not using that, then I'm using like an old fashioned dip nib. Um, John Neal Bookseller, which is like one of the best places to buy calligraphy supplies in um, the U.S., makes like a series so, like for thirty dollars you can buy like a nib sampler and it includes one of every single nib that they sell and so then which is great because then you can start to play with the different flexible dip nibs and see which one you like so that's what i like for pointed pen work um, for brushes i like to use um, the pentel color brush is one of my favorites yeah it's nice and flexible yeah. and and then i also use um like uh like a number two or a number three pointed um, watercolor brush. And for ink, I like to use um, uh, Sumi Ink Moon Palace because it's inexpensive um, and it's just really great. And I go through ink like it crazy. So, great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'll use that. Um, you know, and I like to play with other things too. You know, I like to use, um, you know, ruling pens and, and different things for fun. But I would say if you were to sum it up, it would really like the, 90% of my work is either brush lettered or pointed pen. And I would say out of, out of that 90%, it's half and half. 
Yeah. Got it. So Sarah's asking in the chat bar, I don't know if you see it or not. Oh, where was the nib kit from? I missed it. She's it's from oh. John. John Neal, John Neal bookseller. Let me see if I can hold that up real quick. Okay. And I actually have that on my, um, I actually have that in like one of the resource PDFs. So let me post that in here. John Excellent. Neal books. Yeah. Hey. Oh yeah. That kind of tons okay. of calligraphy and lettering <laughs> supplies. I mean, that's right. what they focus on. So it's a great site to know about. Yeah. Excellent. Cool. We'll go to the next question. All right. Tatiana's asking, hi, Laura, can you recommend us a book on ornamentations? Oh, hmm. Mm. I have not seen a lot, but I think um, the Universal Penman would be an excellent place to start. Yeah. Um, also, like Dover Publishing produces a ton of books that are, you know, historic in nature and that really go over, um, you know, different ornamentation and things like that as well. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Excellent. Yeah, we're going to have to do a follow-up email like, in the next couple of days with yeah. tons and tons of links for you guys. Definitely. So I don't know if you saw uh, Brand's comment here. Oh if you go gosh, to John Neal. Twitter buddy. Oh, I'm so happy he's here. I love he this says, guy. He's great. Blo block off a few hours to drool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. It's the abyss. It's like the swirling oh. abyss. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Yeah. So Aliana is asking, do you vectorize your sketches directly in RoboFont? No, I actually use um, either FontLab or Glyphs. Yeah, so what I do is I actually, like, I scan in the lettering, and then I, this is going to sound kind of funny, I mean, you know, I, I'll go into Photoshop, open up the scan. I don't really do anything in Photoshop, but I'll take and, like, lasso the letter, you know, with the lasso tool, copy it, and then paste it into a Glyph window of FontLab, and then draw around it. Or, you know, with glyphs, you can, you know, save the image and import it like as a, you know, as a JPEG or a TIFF or, and then do the same thing and draw around it. But yeah, I heavily rely on my lettering as a basis for doing typefaces. I, I know there are some people who can actually like sit right down and like point by point draw letters out and that's not me. <laughs> I'm too old school, man. I'm old. Like I got to go back to the drawing board. <laughs> Do you typically try to perfect your letters in hand or do you wait and you do it digitally? I do, do digitally. It. Yeah, yeah. I um, And the reason why is I find that um, sometimes it's not going to work. You know what I mean? So it's like you can spend a ton of time on something by hand and then uh, it doesn't end up working. Um, but I find that in the beginning, most people, and that's actually kind of a good... Um, it's kind of a good point to make is that most people will start out um, by doing a ton of, you know, by really perfecting their lettering at first and then, you know, and then do like subtle refinements in the program. And as you get more experience with drawing vectors and drawing letters, um, you know, it, it becomes pretty easy. You kind of have a vision of what that typeface is going to work like and, you know, it becomes a lot faster and more efficient to just do it in the computer. So, yeah, I'm usually at this point, I'm usually pretty rough with my lettering, which is why, you know, I was kind of hesitant to show it. I was like, this stuff is kind of, yeah. <laughs> so if you're a beginner, it's probably better to really refine, refine it, it mm -hmm. in hand. And then this way you don't spend so much time digitally. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You got it. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Next one. Justina's asking, what are your favorite programs and extensions? Oh, so um, FontLab and Glyphs. And um, I like RMX tools. There's a, it's, um, I forget who creates it, but, um, oh gosh. Anyways, it, it does things like it will slant fonts for you while keeping it. Um, your points in the right place, um, or your nodes in the right place, I should say. You can, it has like a harmonizer to, you know, make your lettering look better. Um, I also use um, Karsten Leuka. He has um, KLTF Make Kern, which is a plugin. And, um, and that's a, a really good one when your kerning pairs start to go way over, you know, what mm. is actually allowed. And um, yeah, I had that happen really early on because I like to design swashes and extra stuff. <laughs> and I have a lot of kerning pairs. <laughs> and we know that. That's why we love you so much. You know that. Thank you. <laughs> Did you say KTLF? Uh, KLTF, sorry. No, no, KLTF. That's yeah. That's me. Okay, good. Excellent. So Eliana said, is this it? Yes, that's Glyph's app. That's where the, that's for font development. Right? Yeah. That link. Okay, excellent. Stands for Karsten Loki. Oh, I'm not good at German. I'm sorry. <laughs> Alana is asking, do we write out entire lowercase and uppercase alphabet prior to digitizing? 
So I will do, um, I tend to do the entire lowercase, you know, um, it's hard, it's, you know, it's, it's, and sometimes I'll, you know, like go with like key letters and not worry about it, but I would say half the time I'll do the entire thing, but I won't do the uppercase letters until kind of after the fact, like I'll have some experimentations, so I'll kind of play with it. Um, and I may even draw some of those letters up initially just to, you know, kind of see what I'm working with. But, um, but yeah, generally I save the uppercase until last, but then I'll go through and draw, you know, all of those. And uppercase letters are really quite unique. You know, they have a different role than the lowercase. Um, you know, where the lowercase is meant to kind of harmonize and work together in a group um, and play well together. You know, the uppercase letters is kind of like the jewel on the crown. And, you know, you want that to really um, stand out and, um, you know, and really do something a little bit different. With scripts, you don't put uppercase, generally, you don't put uppercase letters together. I mean, here's my cat. He's saying hi. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, he's like wandering all over the place okay. here. Okay. What's his name? Bailey. Yeah, Bailey. So there'll be a typeface named Bailey at some point in time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the dogs are at doggy daycare, though, so they don't bark and interrupt this whole thing. <laughs> But you have the, your typefaces, or some of them are named after your dogs, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, okay. any any of my typefaces that have a name um, are named after a person. I mean, they're they're you know literally Elena is my little sister. Um, Yana was a colleague that I worked with, um, a good friend of mine. Yeah, Regina is my mom. Uh, yeah, yeah. So they oh, all have wow. names. Yeah, Buckley okay, is the, yeah Buckley is the only one that wasn't named after a person. But I don't I don't know if that's yeah. Anyway, Fairwater. <laughs> No, Fairwater's, um, yeah. <laughs> like, well, it's a one. name like Sheila or, you know, yeah. Right, okay. Uh, Luke is asking, do you have any tips on vectorizing the letters? Your curves look so organic and natural. Oh, thank you. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, boy, yeah, learning um, what is called, and I've heard Ken Barber was calling it with logarithmic drawing, um, where you have the nodes at, um, at the extrema, and you have all of the uh, handlebars at vertical and horizontal axes, um, except for where they join and except for like in the midst of an OG curve, which is like an S curve. Um, I think there's some good videos out there that show how to draw, how to draw vector forms. Um, but yeah, it's really important to learn um, how to draw like that because, um, you know, for rendering on screen, and I'll tell you a quick example. I remember um, in 2010, I was teaching, um, a design class and I put together my notes and I printed them out using Yana and I was all excited it was like first time that you know I'm using this typeface and when I printed it out it looked like all the letters were bouncing all over the baseline it was it was just a disaster you couldn't really see what was happening and I um, you know I went to TypeCon shortly after like maybe the next week and um, I ran into someone, a famous type, typeface designer whose name I won't mention who, who kind of said you know your style is great but your nodes look like crap and I was like, my nodes look like crap. What does he mean by that, you know? So I started talking to Thomas Finney, um, who's now the vice president of Font Lab. And I said, this is what this guy said to me. What does this mean? And he said, well, let me take a look at one of your fonts. So I pulled up Yana. And I'd had the nodes placed wherever. You know, I mean, there was no, uh, you know, they weren't on the extremum. They were wherever I wanted them to be. And he told me about this drawing style. So when I went home and I fixed up Yana, you know, and literally redrew it, put all the points on the extremum and all the handlebars, and whatever, um, and printed it out again, boom, problem solved. And so I realized that, you know, it's... Um, it's, it's kind of a hard method to get used to, to drawing, but what makes it so important is that, you know, not only does it help your type render better visually, but it also answers the question of where do I put these nodes? You know, how do I, what do I do with these handlebars? I mean, there is a very specific answer to that. Right. So I think knowing that is really kind of the key to that. And um, I'll pull up that, I'll pull up um, some information about that, include that. Right. And yeah. when you talk about extrema points, and I just want to uh, mention that here, extrema is typically the very edge, the furthest away from the the letter form as possible. Yeah. And then you want them typically like 90 degree angles, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. you got it. Okay. I hope that helps, Lou. Yeah. Oh, we keep getting more questions. What happened, guys? <laughs> we were going to go through 10, and all of a sudden we only have five. We have five left still. Eric is asking, what do you look what do you look at for inspiration? Oh, I, you know, I look at a lot of stuff. I actually think having like an inspiration um, library, like an image library is 
Oh, so important. I, um, in my iPad, I have close to 10,000 photos of lettering, illustration, type. And, um, you know, I collect, you know, like magazines like um, Letter Arts Review, which is published by John Neal Books. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll actually like scan in pages and just look and look at tons and tons of lettering. Sometimes, sometimes the inspiration comes from places you wouldn't expect. I mean, sometimes the inspiration comes from an idea. You know, I might be driving along and thinking to myself, like, um, boy, there really needs to be a thicker script out there. You know, like there's not enough thick scripts. So I might go home and, and make that like my mission is to design that. Um, sometimes it may come from um, illustration that I've seen. Uh, Mandevilla came from some an illustration style that was really popular at the time that I, you know, I saw some illustration style and I thought, oh, yeah, it'd be cool to have a, a typeface that would work well with this. Yeah. So it's mostly just in your, your surroundings, your environment and driving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just keep looking. Basically, yeah. just keep giving yourself, feeding yourself visual information, guys. And, and Oh, we'll, you have to. Yeah, be, and you yes. know, if you, if you run out of ideas, and I've always told my students this, um, you know, if you're starting to have a creative block, it's because you're not looking enough. It's You're not spending enough time really looking at imagery, and you need to kind of, you know, like fill your brain back up with that again. Right. Now. Great, great advice. And Richard, thank you so much for posting all these links, Richard. I think has been posting all these links oh, here on the thank side you. as we go. <laughs> yeah. So we do have a question from uh, Richard. What tablet do you use once the letters are in Font Lab or Glyphs? Um, so I use a Wacom tablet. I have been a Wacom tablet user since 1997. Um, I actually don't have a mouse. There is no mouse in my house because I, well, because I use a tablet and because I have a cat that likes to kill them. Um, <laughs> but, um, but I don't use, I don't use the Wacom tablet to draw. A lot of people think that, you know, they're like, oh, I use a draw. And it's like, no, 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 no. Um, I use that instead of a mouse. It's a lot more fine tuned. Um, it's also a little bit more ergonomic. You know, I think that um, it's easier, it's easier on your arm and your hand. And that is important when you get to be, you know, older and, um, but yeah, I've experimented in the past with like the Wacom Cintiq tablets, you know, the monitor tablets. I just couldn't make it work because I so heavily rely on a keyboard, you know, for key commands. And um, yeah, I don't know. Um, but I do use, uh, for sketching, I use iPad Pro and um, the Apple Pencil. And I do a ton of drawing on there, a ton of sketching. Yeah. Okay. I'm glad it's a good tool. Uh, Richard's asking, is it just for editing or cleaning up the vectors? Yeah. Well, it's instead of a, it's instead of a mouse. Instead of a mouse. Okay. Yeah. Great. That helps, Richard. All right. Okay, guys. So stop with the questions. All right. We're going to do two more. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> oh, no, no. I'm saying this is totally engaging and I, I love talking to you. We just don't want to keep everyone so long. Yeah. Uh, so Rashira is asking, what is the least and m the most time that you have spent working on a typeface? I love them all, by the way, and personally want to thank you to include them, so many of them in Adobe Typekit. Wow, thank you. That's so nice. Um, so the least amount of time would probably be about 100 hours. Um, the most, wow. Um, <laughs> gosh, when I did Samantha script, I was on that for months and it was nothing but Samantha script. And um, yeah, that was a tough time because I was first, you know, getting started as a typeface designer and I wasn't publishing anything. And I'm watching my sales tank towards the end and going, I really hope this pays off. And I probably spent like five months solid doing nothing but working on Samantha script. Um, so that was a really big one. Um, collections, you know, I think the Adorn collection was like seven or eight months. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But you're working on a product. I mean, it's going to yeah, pay and, and over time. It's not like... All, yeah. And it's all I do. You know what I mean? So I think, you know, you get pretty quick when that's all, you know, you get you get more efficient and faster when it's all that you do. And um, yeah. So the longer ones, were they at the beginning, like when you just got started, it took longer or no? I kind of make it my mission every year to design something that's going to be like really intensive. You know what I mean? Like really, you know, last year it was Fairwater. Um, trying to remember what it was the year before that was Ed's Market, you know, before that was, uh, you know, charcuterie and, or Adorn and then charcuterie, you know, yeah. Oh, so Teresa says that's still super fast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It that's is. good. Yeah. Okay, good. So, uh, great. Thank you, Rashida. Last one from Lila. And Lila, I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce your name. Sorry. Um, any tips for kerning capitals to capitals at the default level? 
Oh, capitals, capitals on the default. Oh, that's a tough one. Um, yeah, because you end up with a ton of overlaps and they generally just don't work out very well. It's, you know, I kind of, um, it depends on the design, you know, like if it's, if it's not too swashy and too crazy, then I just try to simply avoid collisions. Um, if there's, you know, like long, big swashes in there, then I'll try to do like a strategic overlap. But yeah, I usually, um, when I do spacing, I space lowercase to lowercase, and then I space uppercase to lowercase. And um, yeah, and that's all set my spacing. But with kerning, yeah, there's just, it's one of those things that it's just hard to, it's hard to get, have a good answer for. Yeah, I mean, it usually just looks like a chaotic mess no matter what you do. So you just let, <laughs> you leave it up to the designer to hand kern, which is what they should be doing, right? Yeah, yeah, and hopefully, I mean, not too many people use uppercase, you know, like a whole upper, uppercase setting in a, in a script. So, you know, usually that, you know, kind of saves, saves me a little bit. I mean, I don't have to worry about it too much, but yeah, and kerning them is really hard. Yeah. All right, Lila, if you're still listening, it would be nice to know if you are doing the same or same thing or if you find that uh, there's examples where you need to kern capitals to capitals, let us know in the chat bar. Yeah, and that's Lila, yeah. Lila, sorry. Lila, Lila Simons. Simons. Oh, that's I know, okay. I know. <laughs> I know I love you, but I don't know the person. I don't know how to Oh, no worries. <laughs> no worries. So what we'll do is we'll do a roundup email afterwards. I'll invite everyone. You guys can join the Facebook group here. And uh, what I'll do is I'll list some links in there. We'll also send out email to everybody uh, who is interested in the long list of notes that I have here. Uh, you can't see, but I wrote tons and tons of notes. And um, I just want to know, uh, how is there an average with you, Laura, in terms of how many typefaces you develop or design every year? Boy, man, it just, it depends so widely. Um, probably around like eight to 10. Eight to ten, and are you working on something new now? Oh, that always. Maybe we can wait for like. Always. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> and it's it's gonna be another name one named. E. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, for my friend who hates E's that look like the backward threes, uh -huh. she kept telling me, "I really want one that looks that's like a regular like a regular uppercase E that's kind of a square one." And I was like, "Oh, you're gonna be waiting for a while because this is hard to do." And I finally came up with a design that we showed it to her, and he said, "Yes, let me buy you dinner." We're so <laughs> anyway, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I know I, I get off track with my little stories. Sorry. Oh, I love them. I love. Them. So Lila's asking. There's been a few fonts I have made at work where people have used them. I see it happen. Oh. With stuff, yeah. Yeah. So here's something that I've done in the past with um, script type bases that you really could use uppercase, you know, letters in a setting. Is that I, I'll make like a. It's not uncommon for me to actually have three variations of the uppercase. You know, I'll have the. You know, it's it's kind of like the. Um, you know, I'll have one version that's really simplified, which works perfectly for that. Um, and and you can kern them, and they do look good together. And then I'll have you know like the default set, and then I'll have a swash set. Okay. Yeah. Great. I love the typefaces that have tons and tons of alternates. Yeah, yeah. And Brand says, I sometimes have to do capitals to capitals in book covers. But in those cases, I have to customize the letter forms anyway, so it hardly matters, which great. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's a good amount of my fonts, probably about a dozen that do have uppercase um, sets or, you know, that are simplified uppercase caps that, you know, can be used together like that. Yeah. Right. Well, we look forward to whatever the next projects that are coming out. Hey, and appreciate your time so much, Laura, for giving us this lesson. I really yeah, appreciate it. Thank yeah, thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for the class. I appreciate it was, everybody coming I, on. I'm sure that's the shortest class you've ever taught, 20 minutes or 30 <laughs> minutes, right? <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good. So again, we'll send everyone an email with a link to the video that she was showing, as well as some of these resources. And if you guys have any questions, please post them in the Facebook group, and we can keep the conversation going there. Yeah, awesome. All right, have a good day, guys. Yeah, you Thank too. You. Okay, Thank bye. you. Bye. Thank you, Lai. Yeah. Bye, guys. Thanks. <laughs>